Lord God, what a great song, what a great reminder of your true gospel, Lord, and how your gospel brings peace amongst difficult circumstances. Lord, what a, what a wonderful hymn to be able to remember and to be able to cling to. Lord, what great truths, God. Speak to us as we enter into this time of communion, Lord, in your name, amen. Welcome. This is the time of our worship service where we get to, as a group, remember the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross. Each week, one of the elders or one of the men in this church stands up and gives a message to help us remember and savor that gospel. I was thinking about this practice this week, and it surprised me how this never gets old. An analogy came to mind. So humor me as I kind of play this out. Think of the gospel like a diamond something that we look at with admiration. A diamond is made up of facets, and I want to talk about those facets. So I Googled it and found some information because I'm not a jeweler. Um, a facet is the flat surface on the shape of the diamond. For example, if you look at the brilliant cut diamond, you'll see the stone consists of 57 facets. The crown of the diamond has 33, the girdle has 24, um, which is underneath the pavilion. Um, some round, brilliant cut diamonds have 58 facets, and the facets are arranged in such a way to make sure the right amount of light enters the diamond, as well as reflect from the diamond. It is considered a good thing to have more facets because more facets will give more sparkle. The facets are what make a diamond beautiful, but one on its own is just a flat surface. The facets work together with each other to bring out the brilliance of the diamond. When it comes to the design of a diamond, industry experts say that a diamond's fire, brilliance, and scintillation depend on the perfect proportion and symmetry of the facets. The purpose of the crown and the pavilion facets therefore play a completely different role in the performance of a diamond's brilliance. For a diamond to reach its full potential, it needs to be cut correctly by a skilled craftsman. When a diamond is cut to perfect proportion and symmetry, light will reflect in a way where the diamond appears brilliant. The gospel is a diamond. The Holy Spirit is the craftsman that has written the perfect number of facets of that gospel in God's word and given us an unbelievable way to see it. There are more facets to the gospel than we can even comprehend. And when we come to the Lord's table, we try to shed light on one facet so that we can see the fire, brilliance, and scintillation of the gospel. I urge you, as you open up God's word this week, to take that approach. Look at the words on the page, not just as words, but as a facet of the most beautiful truth we can ever know. So this morning, I wanna look at Colossians 1, verses 13 and 14, and see a facet of the beautiful gospel. Turn there with me. Colossians, 13, or Colossians 1, verse 13. For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Christian, there are two very important phrases in verse 13. The first, he rescued us from the domain of darkness. That is to say, he saved or liberated us. We were captured under the rule of darkness. Romans calls this being a slave to sin. The power or domain of darkness refers to an idea of complete disorder. We were in a condition of wretchedness. The word rescue here is helpful. It shows us that in this condition, we cannot escape in our own strength. When you need to be rescued from something, it means you are trapped with no way out. This isn't the picture of a fork in the road and you see a sign at the fork and it says Jesus to the right, sin and destruction to the left, and so of course you choose right. We were born in a state of complete wretchedness and disorder and had no way out. We were in a ravine with unclimbable walls, and Jesus came down into that ravine and pulled us out against our will. Which leads me to the second phrase. We were rescued not just from somewhere, but transferred to somewhere. That where is the kingdom of his beloved son. He took us from Satan's dark realm and placed us into the bright light of Jesus' kingdom. 
This is the picture of being reestablished as a new citizen of a different kingdom. This isn't a kingdom in a physical sense, but more like we are under the sovereign rule of the Lord Jesus over our hearts. We have a new identity. We are God's people. As 1 John put this, we moved from darkness into light. Romans 6 once again informs this by saying we were no longer slaves to sin, but now we're slaves to righteousness. And then verse 14 tells us how this happened. We were in, we're in Jesus' kingdom because he provided redemption. If we were to read on, we would see this develop more fully. We'd learn that we have been reconciled through the blood of his cross. The redemption here is a picture of Jesus buying us back by paying the debt for our sins. That debt was paid on the cross and involved taking the punishment we deserved for our sins. This facet of the gospel shows us fire-like illumination of the beauty of the cross. This is a picture that should cause us to worship him. If we sit there and meditate on the depth of the darkness we were in and the extreme brilliance of the light that we're in as Christians, we should be in awe. So as we prepare our hearts for the Lord's table, what can we learn today? Christian, I want to speak to you first. Do you savor this? Do you remember daily what God saved you from? Do you remember where you were before God changed your heart? What about what he saved you to? We're in the dominion of Jesus. What a great place to be. Does this motivate the way you live today? There's another group here. There are some here who have not been rescued. Maybe you're here because you've always been a part of the church and you feel comfortable here. Maybe you're here just because a friend or family brought you. We're really glad you're here. We'd love to talk to you about how this rescue happened. However, during communion this morning, please let the cup and bread pass. This time of communion is a time of worship reserved for those that put their trust in Jesus. If you have questions, please see me after the service, any one of the elders or the person that brought you. We'd love to talk to you about our Savior. The men will come through the aisles and offer you a cup and a gluten-free cracker. Go ahead and take communion on your own today. And if you're streaming, I would like to encourage you to find a way to take communion in your home. This isn't exactly about the elements and what they are, but the intention is that we use the time to remember the body and blood of Christ and worship him together. So let's do that. Men, please serve us.